coming up on the Knowledge Industry Podcast. You've got two metrics. You've either got the audience or you've got the income. And I would say now it's more successful than it was before. But if we looked at the metrics, there was a time I was getting about 500,000 listeners a month, which was huge, but it was killing me. And I was uh, getting all these listeners, but not making any money because I didn't have any time to do anything with the people that was coming through to me. Should you start a podcast and how would it fit into your business strategy? In this episode, I'll be speaking with David Ralph, successful podcaster and entrepreneur. So how did David go from being an ex-corporate trainer to running a successful podcast called Join Up Dots? Do you sell online courses or run live workshops? Do you have expertise that can help people in life or business? Are you even running an online training empire from your kitchen table? Then you're part of the knowledge industry, a fast-growing industry that means that you can learn almost anything and anyone can create a business around what's between their ears. Welcome to the Knowledge Industry Podcast with your host, Mark Egan. So, David, thanks for joining me. Uh, how are you doing? You all right? I am very well, Mr. Egan. We've known each other for so many years. I remember the first time I saw you, you was like a small child. And look <laughs> at you. You've got a beard. You, 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 you've grown up into a, a, a fully grown man. You're, you're looking good, sir. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think this is more of a kind of a dishevelled lockdown look. You know, if, if you're listening to this, think Tom Hanks in that. What was that one where he shipwrecked? But anyway, um, you know, I, I was looking at your your bio and thinking, where do you start with your story? Because you've done all sorts of different things. And it's almost like different chapters. But the one sort of thing I want to sort of start with is, you know, you now, you know, successful online business. You've done various things. You've got a very successful podcast. But you used to work in corporate training and that changed pretty quickly. So tell me about what you used to do and what was that kind of pivotal moment? Let's start with a pivotal moment. The, the pivotal moment was when I suddenly realized I was bored with the job and I was entertaining myself. Now, if you're a corporate trainer, what you need to do is make sure that the, the content is relevant, that the attendees are getting the most out of it and you're getting return of investment. They're the three things. So if somebody pays you to do a training course, you want people to change, learn, develop, and then the company gets um, interest. Um, I started to throw in jokes and throw in little stand-up routines, and the, the crowd were loving it, but I knew that I was on a slippery slope because I was pulling away from the content. I, I wasn't doing what should be done. So that was the first dot that sort of led me into Hang On, something's pulling me to move away from where I was um, and then I had a, a boss that turned up and the boss was brilliant and he said look you can come into the office when you want you can do your courses you can you know if I don't see you for six weeks it doesn't matter and so I was out in the garden in the afternoon you know and then just swanning in doing two hours training and then leaving watching videos in you know it, it was brilliant and then another boss took his place and said, I want you in your desk at eight o'clock in the morning. You're not leaving till five o'clock. I want to see you every second of the day. And when you've had that freedom and then it's been pulled away from you and you're kind of bored, you're looking for something else. And that's when I put something in my ear called a headphone and I listened to a podcast. And then I thought, oh. I listened to another one and I listened to three back to back. Uh, I've now been on all those podcasts and I thought to myself, that's for me. I'm going to be a podcaster. Little did I know, sir, that it's not just talking into a microphone and um, having people listen to you and give you loads of money. Um, that's how it's kind of alluded to. But as you know, there's a there's a bit that goes on behind the scenes. But I mean, from that moment, so literally you just thought, I'm not having this. I'm leaving. Uh, what happened then? You know, because I've done the same thing. I've walked away from a very good job. It's that one's with the BBC. Um, mm -hmm. And I know there is a moment where you kind of, this is really exciting and it's really terrifying at the same time. What was that journey like for you? I didn't have the terrifying bit because I decided that what I was going to do was become a web developer. I thought, I can build websites. They're quite easy to do. People are paying me. I didn't realise that actually I hated building websites when it was more than a hobby, when it was something I was doing for myself, but when it was looking for clients and stuff. So I lasted three days of being a web developer. Then I went into a depression because I thought, Christ, what have I done? You know, should I contact my old company and say, you know, I've made a mistake, I'll come back to you. Um, fortunately for me, ego kicked in, pride kicked in, and I just put my head down and thought, right, 
I need to make this work. And that's one of the lessons I say to people, you know, don't ever run back, always look forward because there's always something out there that you can do. And it may not be what you want to do, but it will help you move forward. And ultimately it's paying the bills. So no, I didn't have that fear. I didn't have that terror, but I did have that, that position of, is this what my life's going to be like? I thought it was going to be exciting. It's, this isn't exciting. And I, I'm very much into that. And I'm still into that like 10, 15 years down the line. If, if I think to myself, I'm getting bored with something, I'm very quick to start looking at it and thinking, okay, it might be lucrative, but is it worth it? And then I sort of leave it behind. And sometimes you come back to it about three years later and you think, actually, I, I, I wouldn't mind doing that again. You know, that, that's all right. But I, I need to keep that excitement. I like to, I'm like Tigger on Crystal Meths. I, I like <laughs> to spring around and feel happy. Um, I don't know if that would work. I'm not big on Crystal Meths, so I don't know if that would actually yeah. give you the bounce. I'm not sure that description you get my was sentiment. on your bio, was it? You know, like it Tigger wasn't on Meth, my bio. I'll make sure we add that kind of thing. But I mean, okay, so you, you had that moment, you had your up, decided to sort of go forward. How quickly did the whole podcasting thing come about? Very quickly. Um, I decided from the moment I thought to myself I could do this, I sent a voice message to a guy who I was listening to the podcast and it was on a tiny little laptop. It was a terrible audio, but I just kind of thought I want to get my voice out there I, I, because it's all right having these ideas in your head, but actually then doing it, you can sit there forever and a day. So I recorded this little voice message, sent it through to him. He then played it on his show, hugely exciting that I was like on the internet and I was listening to myself back. Then I sent an email to Elton John saying, come on my show, Elton, you'll love it. Of course, I didn't get a response response two seconds later I sent another one and the guy responded about 30 seconds afterwards it was Saturday lunchtime and I suddenly thought oh my god I'm doing this I've now got a guest on my show I'm doing this. so you got the guest and before you actually kind of properly yeah, formulated yeah, the podcast. I, knew, okay. if, I, di I didn't know how to yeah I didn't have a microphone I didn't have anything I just had started having the guests lined up and uh, I did 365 shows in the first year actually more than that because I did some solos so I did about 420 shows in the first year um, until my audience said too much you know can you slow down and they were trying to listen to every show seven hours plus a week you know it was too much and so we went three days a week after that and we've been doing that ever since and just how I mean for people if they should know join up dots but if they haven't uh, just what tell us a bit about what it's about and kind of how successful it's been it was very very successful um, there, there was a, it's, it's funny, you've got two metrics. You've either got the audience or you've got the income. And I would say now it's more successful than it was before. But if we looked at the metrics, there was a time I was getting about 500,000 listeners a month, which was huge. But it was killing me. And it was promoting and going on LinkedIn and Facebook and all. Oh, and I was uh, getting all these listeners but not making any money because I didn't have any time to do anything with the people that was coming through to me. Now I've slowed it down um, and yeah, I suppose it's successful because it gives me a full time, it gives me a very nice living um, and it's on my terms. So I would say it's, I would say it's very, very successful, Mark, because <laughs> I can do it when I want, where I want. I don't have to chase the money. It just kind of comes to me. But, but there, the, there was but a time the, the, it was an audience. But there was, a, you know, the, the missing ingredient there, which a lot of people have is, Everybody's got this idea, you know, we need to start a podcast. Everyone is supposed to start a podcast. Um, and, you know, you said that it pays the bills. But how does it pay? Like, how, how have you managed to monetize that? Well, in the first start, I was doing anything that came along. So if somebody came along, I would say, yeah, I could do that. So I remember, you know, building websites because I could do that. And then I did podcast training, which is how we connected many, many years ago. And then I become one to one podcast coach. And then I realized I couldn't be bothered to do that. And so I started doing business coaching um, and then I couldn't be bothered to do that. And so I went on to sort of online business coaching. And now there's about five or six things that I do that sort of fluctuates. Mentorship is another one. Now, you can't get away, unless you're Howard Stern or Joe Rogan, 
you can't get away, in my view, of having to do something behind the scenes of a podcast. You know, very few people will get an audience big enough to be able to make enough of sponsorship, even though that's a kind of utopia that is sort of given to you at the beginning. Ah, oh, you just create this audience and then you monetize it. That's a big mistake. So you, you've got to do stuff, but it doesn't have to be stuff you don't want to, to, to do but there was a lot of that in the early days and I remember being you know I, I remember bending over for 50 dollars mate you know it was just anything that came along I think okay that would pay my telephone bill for this month I will do that and little by little it sort of um it it grew then I had my first six-figure month now that wasn't through me that was doing um a, a, a code promotion with a lady in America and she had a big audience and she asked me on and we made something about 145,000 through this webinar for the month and that that was my next dot when it was suddenly my god it does work you know that that's like not just a year's money for most people that's like three or four years money and you can do it in that one go before then I think I was very much yeah, I believe you can do it, but there was that voice inside saying, you've got to go out to work. You've got to work hard. You can't just do two hours a day. You know, you've got to slog it. That was the first time when I thought, my God, my God. And I've done that three times in the last eight years, but I don't really force that. So, I mean, because join up dots, it's a, it's a Steve Jobs quote, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to just talk a little bit about that. And when you've, you've done all these different things, almost reinvented yourself, moved in different directions, it kind of matches the whole kind of join up dots it does, idea, doesn't yeah. it? It's a journey, isn't it? Yeah, it does. Steve Jobs did a speech back in 2005 when he said to a group of Stanford um, graduates, you've got to trust, you've got to have karma, you've got to have faith, but you can't see how you get to somewhere until you look back, and he called it connect the dots. And I was actually in my previous life as a corporate trainer, and this guy went off to the dentist, and he came back, and you know when you go to the dentist, it's the only time you read ladies' magazines, just killing time, and there's Marie Claire, and I think it was in Marie Claire, and he said, this speech is brilliant. And so he gave me the written down speech, and I didn't connect it with, I'm going to make a podcast and call it Join Up Dots. I don't actually remember how Join Up Dots actually started. It's, it almost just grew around me. But there was something in his, his speech that resonated with me. That, yeah, it's all right planning stuff, but you don't know how life is going to operate. And so why plan? Why don't you just move through fluidly and, and see what happens? And as long as you do stuff every day, the dots will join up. And now I've interviewed two and a half thousand people and I think literally every single person goes, yeah, I agree with that. I, he, he hit the nail on the head. Dots do join up, but you've got to get off your backside and you've got to go off and do it. You know, it's like I've known you for, for 60 years now. Yeah. And you have gone through many different changes. And like me, I know you've had times when you've queried and you've had doubts and stuff. And then there's other times that you're firing on all cylinders and you're still going, you're still moving along. And as I said to a guy the other day, I'm now 51 years old. Yes, I know it's hard to believe, but I'm 51 years old. How many decisions have I made in 51 years? Some brilliant, some terrible, some absolute lunacy, some why would I ever do that again? But I'm still moving forward. So no decision is a game changer. If you make a silly one, you just make another one and sort of get back on track. But you've got to keep on moving forward. Yeah, keep progressing. Um, on the podcasting thing, um, what would, because people must come in and ask your advice and say, look, you know, maybe I've got a business. Maybe I want to build my authority in a certain area. Um, thinking of starting a podcast. What's the main advice you would give to somebody who's thinking of starting a podcast and maybe seen your success, what would you say? The thing I say all the time is don't do it. And I, I always say to people, don't start a podcast unless, and this is the caveat, you've actually got a business already. And, you know, I started the podcast and tried to grow a business around a podcast. Terribly difficult because you've got nothing to hang on it. And you've got to have like an authority base. You've got to have an experience. So people go, oh, I'm listening to Mark Egan. Oh, he really knows his stuff about video. I'll check him out. Boom. So you've got to have a business first of all. Now, if you've got that, then go for it. But do it properly. 
don't listen to crappy ones. You know, I occasionally go over to iTunes. The audio is terrible. And people think they can just throw it out and they get to about 30 episodes and then they do this big episode of why I'm stopping this podcast and what it means to you. And I always think, it doesn't mean anything to me because you've only been going 30 episodes, you know. If you've done 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, why don't you just say, this is part of my business, this is my strategy, this is another income producing, this is my social media, and keep it going. You know, it doesn't have to be hard, but there's got to be something attached to it. And it, it annoys me, Mark, it really does, that people will wally around on Facebook doing silly things, but they don't go to something that is expanding every year, which is podcasting, and try to do it the best they possibly can, and try to make sure that the audio sounds as good as Ken Bruce on Radio 2, and not, you know, Jim Bruce, who's sitting in his cupboard on some tiny little smartphone that Mark Egan has convinced him <laughs> is really good audio to do stuff with, you know? Get a proper mic and do it right. Now, I, I mean, one thing I would say, if if you haven't heard Join Up Dots, you should uh, go and listen to it. Because one thing I really like, and this is obviously, I'm like, interviewing you is almost like being the support act for Elvis or something, you know. It's, um, but you've got a very uh -huh. um, conversational, like almost sort of naughty sense of humor kind of style of interviewing. So what, what's your thought process? Of what makes a good kind of interview? What makes engaging content on a podcast? Do your preparation. You know, if you're going to go onto a show as a guest, listen to two or three of those shows. I'm blown away by people that come on my show. Quite obvious they haven't listened to even an episode. Um, so make sure that you've done your preparation. Um, I always try my best to know the ins and outs of the person's keynote story, because otherwise you're going to get the same thing. Have fun. Be engaging and set a comfortable environment at the beginning. Now, I won't tell you on the show what, what, what I, but I set a scene and I actually say to the people, you know, you can imagine, you know, blah, 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 and I tell them what to experience so that they can relax into it and know that I'm a safe pair of hands. You know, I'm not going to try to catch them out. And it's my job to make them feel comfortable. And that's one of the things. But so you've you got me very ranty here. You've, you've pushed me in <laughs> That's directions. Not hard. <laughs> One of the things that annoys me where people go, I'm a podcast host. You go to LinkedIn, everyone's a podcast host. But I think being a host is about making the person as comfortable as possible. If you're a host of a party, it's about welcoming them at the door and bringing them in and making sure sure that they're you know they're comfortable and their glasses are filled up and you hear a lot of podcasts they're bored the host is bored you know and if the host is bored why should the guest raise their game so I think you've really got to you know raise your game show enthusiasm and really listen and try to make it an experience for that person that feels like love you know, I, I actually literally fall in love with every single woman that I speak to um, through the show and probably 99 percent of the men as well, because there's such a connection because I'm trying my absolute best to really, really bring something out of them which they haven't had before, um, that they feel touched, you know, and once you get that touch, you've got a connection yeah. forever. And, you know, one last thing, just some podcasts in a more kind of technical sense. If you know, you said have a business and it should be part of almost like doing your social media. So how do you best use the po podcast? Maybe it's the choice of guests, the topics to actually kind of fuel your business. It's because you obviously can create engaging content that doesn't actually go anywhere. Yeah. So how do you choose the people yeah, and the yeah. topics? It has to stick within the theme. OK, now, if somebody comes through to, and pitches to me and says, I would be a great guest. No, you're not coming on. OK, it's not for you to tell me you're going to be a great guest. And one of the things that I've learned over the years, if somebody comes through and says, I'm really amusing, they're not. <laughs> no, nobody ever says they're funny if they're funny. They don't they need just, to, do they? You know, they just yeah. no, they don't need to. They just do it. So I'm very aware of who actually comes on the show. But you've got to have a hook. 
you've got to have a reason for somebody to listen and then come over to your website okay so one of the things that I do on my join up dots is I realize that a lot of people were saying I'd really like to start my own business but I don't know how to do it so I created a seven part video course showing them how I come up with business ideas that they can just come across download free of choice um, and I find you know people will come through to me two years later and say oh I downloaded that two years ago um, what do you think about these ideas and then they become sort of coaching clients and stuff so there's got to be a hook and there's got to be a hook where it's I will show you how to do it but I also need you to realize that's a lot harder than you think yeah okay everyone thinks they can podcast but podcasting isn't what you think getting the podcast out there no problem you can do that in 10 minutes and as my dad used to say when I started learning to drive I can teach you to drive in five minutes it's dealing with all the idiots on the road that's the different ball game and it's true if the roads were all empty and you were the only car around you wouldn't have any problem driving you could you know literally jump into a car and that's the same with podcasting and anything you've got to provide the authority but you've also got to provide the authority that says hang on guys I've been in it for a few years now I know a few things that no one else is telling you that's how you create the hook and that's I mean that's one thing I think I find that you talk about things I mean let's say the knowledge industry so that's you know people doing online coaching training all that kind of thing and it's obviously this dream lifestyle that people have. They want to be sitting in the garden and, you know, earning money whilst they sleep, all this kind of thing. Um, but when you look online, it seems that it's easy and nobody ever has any problems. You know, they kind of successfully run a few courses, have a coaching business, you know, use their expertise. And then it just, you know, they've reached the promised land and that's all good. Whereas you're very open about the fact that actually it is more difficult. There are ups and downs and you know it's just there are just different challenges aren't there the very first business I created I didn't know anything about online business I went over to blogspot which was like a Google free website I created a free website I gave a free sort of PDF away I didn't know anything about any of this and it just seemed logical to me and very quickly I was making 22 to 30 grand a month okay and it was a gambling site where I would we, a guy came through to me in an office and he said oh I've got this strategy that I worked out how to win sporting bets and oh I wasn't interested and he started showing me and I thought hang on I might be interested here and yeah I took this and I fine-tuned it and fine-tuned it and I very quickly put it online and had a thousand people signing up at 30 pounds a month and I was making a lot of money my wife thought I was a genius but actually I hated it because I knew there was a possibility with gambling that you could lose you, you, you know it can go both ways so when I was doing the results and it was all going through and you were getting eight out of ten wins and stuff it felt effortless but then once it got a bit struggle I was waking up every morning with a stomach ulcer really thinking oh my god you know all these people have put their money in oh you know what should I do so I had to close it uh, but the thing that it, I, it taught me was at its core value that's the problem it's not about being clever it's about providing value to people in a way that they understand what they're getting and I always say to people if you controlled oxygen you'd be a billionaire by lunchtime you would just say 10p a month everybody would buy it they wouldn't even quibble because we need oxygen and what we need to do in online business is actually think what do people really need but what do they understand that they really need as well and I think that's one of the things where people struggle they come up with these concepts where actually they don't touch into the 10 social triggers of marketing where people go that's what I want and it could be save money uh, save time feel better against the Joneses look better you know there's about 10 of them and once you bring that into your business um, through join up dots one of the things that has increased my income exponentially is the fact that I tell people I don't want to work with them um, and people used to say oh you can't do that and I can do that because it's made it more valuable because when people do come through to me and I accept them they're more willing to do the work they're better clients we get better results 
and it proves that I'm living the life that they want to live themselves. I'm living the, yeah, I've spent this morning sitting in the garden reading a book. Really? I've spent it in a conference hall in Solihull, networking with loads of people. It's not the way I operate. I want how you operate. And once you've lived through that, I think that's when it all comes together. So it's, it is easy. It, online business is easy, but we overcomplicate it. We target the wrong people, or worse, we just make it too, too messy somehow with ops in and lead magnets and this going off and that going off. And when it breaks down, you don't know it's happening. And then somebody says, oh, I went over to your website and that link didn't work. Strip it all back, be as simple as possible. Let it be totally clear what you're offering to the world and the right people will come your way. Yeah, so a few things you can have... Um almost seem to be like a mantra for you. One is simplicity, you know, cut to the chase. What's this all really about? What's it at its core? And the other is consistency. You know, whether it's in yeah. your values or in just doing lots and lots of podcasts, it's the consistency. Um, but, you know, just um, I'm conscious of time, um, the, you know, bringing things up to date now. You can keep me as long as you oh, want, right. Mark. Well, you in can, that case, you, you know, start that. We'll go, I've got 500 you, more you questions. You can be the Joseph Fritzel. <laughs> the Joseph Fritzel of, of <laughs> yeah, podcasting. Yeah, never let you go. Um, the... Hmm. Um, you know, bring things up to, you know, you, you've you gone through, you said, did, and done podcasting and stuff about online business and all that kind of thing. And more recently, you've got interested in, you know, health, health and well-being. Yeah. And yeah. part of that seems to be the fact that if you do have one of these kind of businesses, um, I mean, like right now, I'm standing up, you know, I used to sit down and do everything. Now I stand up because I was just conscious that I'm all day, you know, doing things and I'm training or on my computer and I'm sitting, it's just not healthy. And so in a strange way, just mentally, sometimes with the interaction with other human beings in the flesh or just physically, this can sometimes be of quite an unhealthy industry, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, how have you found that? And then what are the kind of things you've done to make sure that you have a successful business, but a successful lifestyle? A few years ago, I had acute burnout and it literally killed me and it brought me to my knees. And it was the moment that I had to assess what was needed in my business and strip it back. And that's one of the things I found, first of all, that when I stripped back the business, a lot of it wasn't required. I, I could just sort of like do the bare minimum. That gave me a lead in to actually looking after myself. And, you know, I'm now 51 years old. Unfortunately, when you're in your 30s, no issues. 40s, you start aching a bit. And then by the time you get to your 50s. And so I've started cycling. I used to have two cars. We got rid of one car and I jump on a bike and, and cycle to where I want to go if I want to do it. I look after myself, what I'm eating. Um, and I've come across a lady who is into eating clean. So you eat not processed foods, fresh vegetables and um, and fruit and just sort of good stuff that falls off a tree, really. Um, that wasn't as good for me because I lost so much weight. Um, my wife was saying, oh, my God, look at you. You look like Mo Farrell on a diet. You need to you need to sort yourself out. Um, and so it's trying to find that balance of what sits good with you and not. But it gives you the energy that you didn't realize that you were lacking. It's one of those things that once you plug yourself back in and like sleep the other night, I went to bed at six o'clock at night because I felt tired. I slept through to 6.30 the next morning. Now, my kids laugh at me because I spend all my time asleep now. I'm generally like, a, you know, an old cat where that's just la napping all over the place because I see that as the huge benefit that I, I wasn't giving myself. And when people say to me, oh, I only have to operate on three hours a night. And I think you idiot because you might be able to operate three hours a night at the moment, but down the line, that's going to catch up with you. And it caught up with me. So to answer your question, I drink five litres of water a day. I cycle. I spend more time sitting in the garden just thinking about things and letting thoughts fly and being in front of my computer. I sleep a lot. And, um, yeah, I, I, I think I'm getting sexier by the moment, mate. I'm, I, I'm, well, I'm clearly chasing you. I'm chasing you, obviously. Um, and, you know... Um, for somebody who, you know, you, you came from, you know, that corporate environment, um, you, you know what it's like. I mean, it, horses for courses, you know, some people like going into the office and having, you know, that kind of routine. For me, I, that was something I was kind of very keen to escape from. I could never imagine going back to that. But if someone was listening to this and they were thinking, you know what, there are things I've got some expertise, I've got some knowledge, I, I could maybe teach something or help people with something or 
Um, so I kind of like the idea of, you know, sitting in the back garden, reading the book and going to bed at six or whatever. Um, what would be your advice to them in the sense that, you know, did you say going to bed for sex or going to bed? <laughs> well, hey, either way, with your lifestyle, just, it's probably does, it's okay. probably the same thing. Um, but you know, they, they 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 like the sound of all this, but that you kind of they come to you and they say, look, what what would your advice be? What would you say? I would say if you can do something in an office really really well, then take that as your starting point. But be aware that that's your starting point. You've got to learn marketing. You've got to learn sales. You've got to learn the other thing. But if you've got the passion for it, you know, I still every now and again think to myself, it'd be quite nice to work in an office and see people and go in there. But I think I could do two days and then that would be enough. You know, I, I wouldn't want that restriction. But everything out there is is about providing value. I come back to that. And it doesn't have to be big value there's a woman on, on on Netflix called Marie Kondo and she's a Chinese woman and she just basically teaches you to tidy up your drawers you know that's it and she says put all your clothes on the bed and then then make a decision and you think I could do that myself but obviously people aren't doing it themselves and she's made millions and so it's those kind of things that you think to yourself there's no such thing as a stupid idea it's just providing support and value to the right person and once you do that you're you're on the right roads but it then does come through the marketing and you know the sales and the structure all that kind of stuff is a totally different ballgame so in summary, if you can find something that you can do really well in your office and you know that other people want that same thing. You can, can I tell you a quick story? story? I'm going I'm to tell you a quick story, but in a long version. That's how I like to do it. Um, there was a, a girl that I used to work with and we had a computer system and it was some one of these sort of bespoke ones where the company was really small at the beginning and then they stuck this bit on and they stuck that bit on and the IT system was always ready to break down and there was only this girl who knew how to sort of make it all work um, and a, a guy as well called Kenny. Now this girl was very good at doing the coding and we didn't have any idea about coding and so she just did this job. She was earning, we say, 25 grand, okay, which was quite good money locally. She went off to lunch and met one of her friends, and her friend's boss came along, and he said, oh, uh, Jim, okay, when you come back, we need to know about blah, 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 and she said this coding thing. And she went, oh, sorry to jump in, but that's quite easy. And he went, is it? We've been trying to sort this out for ages. Um, can you come back later on? So anyhow, she comes back later on, and he says, right, we want to hire you 70 grand. Right, she went up from like 25 to 70 grand. She then goes back to our office and says to the people, right, I'm leaving because they've offered me 70 grand. Our managers apparently knew what she was worth to them, so said, okay, we, we, we go to six figures. She went back to there. Her salary went from 25,000 to about 150,000 within two days, just because she found the right person who needed her value, okay? And that's the key thing. If you can do something really well in your company, there's a good chance that somebody out there is wanting that same thing. So you don't almost have to be entrepreneurial. You can be a consultant and allow that to be transitioned between different companies. And it's a kind of stepping stone, would you say, Mark, between sort of working for someone and entrepreneurship, that bit in the middle where actually business is coming through through Upwork and freelancing and stuff with the right value. Yeah. And one thing I did want to ask you, because I've one privilege of podcasting is you get to people speak to obviously good looking people like yourself um but you you know you get insights you get people's whole life experience you know summed up and you interviewed so many people you know lots of very people very successful businesses people from you know nutrition all sorts of people um what would you say is the main thing you learned from having all of those conversations the main thing I've learned is what I learned right at the very beginning and ignored them because it was stupid advice. It was the kind of advice that I didn't get until later on. And I used to say to people right in the very beginning, you know, what's your day like? And I used to say, oh, well, I'd get up. I get up about six o'clock and I exercise for an hour. And then I write in my gratitude journal and then I meditate. for. And I used to think, how do you get anything done? How do you get anything done if you're doing all that kind of stuff? 
biggest thing that I've learned is the successful people do less work than anyone because what they do is the right work. And so they have drilled down on that 5% that their genius is at and the 95% that people like us Oh, I can just build a website. Oh, I can just do Facebook ads. Oh, I can just do that. They don't go anywhere near it. They get other people to do that because they just focus in on that 5%. And the other thing they do is they don't fill in blank time just to be busy. You know, the amount of people have said to me, if I come in and I've got a meeting in the office and that meeting's cancelled, I go straight home. I go and play golf. I go, they don't just go, oh, while well, I'm here, I do a load more work. They almost leave themselves charging up so that when they have to do that thing, they're good for that thing, you know. And that's one of the things I see with people podcasting. They think they can just squeeze it in and they will be working and they go, oh, I can make it at three o'clock and I just squeeze it in. It's a real energy thing to do what you're best at when you do it um and so i think that's the things that i've learned do less of everything so that you can do the thing that you're best at better than anyone and you become you become like mark Eagle. <laughs> you say that funnily enough exactly what you were saying there you know people you listen to podcasts you read books and they say you know start your morning with your own agenda you know meditate make a list of things you want to achieve all this kind of stuff and yeah i've i've been like you funnily enough recently i've tried to um be a lot more productive with my day actually kind of schedule things and actually slot times if i'm going to be doing things try and do more of that but like you i've heard that for years and just thought yeah they're just saying that surely they don't really do that but then everybody seems to say it you know plan your day use your time better and don't waste your time doing things that you're not very good at either outsource them or stop doing them so um fully behind you on that because this got this got sent through to me i get lots of books sent through it's the wrong way around on it yeah. you might um, need to read out the title if somebody don't, isn't watching the video <laughs> yeah it, it's called memos from the head office and it just turned up in my post and um guests come on the show and they send me their books and i will spend you know i will probably have read that book by tomorrow and i just look at it as there's gold and then i've got this book the happiness plan you can't see that this guest is coming on the show and i will spend more time reading books than actually working because there's ideas in there and if you're working you're not getting the ideas you're just getting work and so i do spend a lot of time sitting back watching youtube videos motivational speeches ted talks not connected to work but it is it is it's kind of fueling you up until you go ah that's a good idea, you know. Um, Jack Canfield, you know the chicken yep. soup for the soul guy? He was on my show and he was telling me about this woman who used to be a, a business uh, guru. And uh, he, she said to him, you know, it, it's good, it pays the money, but, you know, I'd like to spend my time surfing. And he said, well, why don't you teach people to surf? And she said, oh, I'm not at that level. I'm not at that level to teach people to surf. And he said, there's always a level you can find that people want so anyhow she goes down to whatever beach it is jumps on her surfboard and um she takes a dog with her and the dog jumps on the back of the surfboard or on the front of the surfboard and she's surfing and the dog's sort of standing there and this guy says to her oh i'd love to do that i always have to leave my dog at home but he won't go on the surfboard and she said well it will you just need to teach it certain things bang that was her business and now she goes around the world teaching people to surf with their dogs you know um, but if it wasn't for her stepping away from the work and actually looking around and seeing what needs to be done, which you don't in front of your computer, you only find the next stage to join up the dots by living life, then you're not going to get there. So that's why I say to people, walk away from your computer, turn your computer off, you know, think of it as value being paid back to you by walking in the countryside, going for a walk in the woods, you will gain far more than sitting there looking at Messenger and Facebook and emails for eight hours a day. It's not going to teach you. Anything. I love the term you use, I think it was, uh, charge yourself back up again, because it's like that. And also, like, yeah. I would count as an introvert. So if I'm, you know, out, doing something and speaking in front of people, actually afterwards I'm, fine, I'm quite exhausted. So that's an important thing to kind of, you know, recharge your batteries. Um, yeah, because I'm an introvert okay. as well. And I didn't, 
yeah, people used to say I was an extrovert, but I didn't realise that the extrovert and the introvert is where you get your power from. So I'm very much like when I'm on this or doing a training course or something, I'm all into it. And then as soon as I finish, don't talk to me, you know. Oh, can, can we meet up with you? No, I don't want to meet up with you. You know, I need to have those days on my own so that I can sort of come come big again send up the bat signal and i'm there but you know if i'm not ready for it and that's the introvert extrovert thing yeah it's that self-awareness isn't it that if you were going to mm. build a business and a lifestyle you have to understand yourself you know i did the it was a myers briggs test yes yeah, um yeah. so i think it was infp i was um and the minute i sort of understood that it was like okay now i understand why i'm tired at that point or why um also why i love teaching i, I you know mm. why i enjoy the fact that you know if i know something i can help other people I get more pleasure out of that than maybe creating a, a TV program, a video in the, you know, backgrounds yeah. in video, and that being really successful and winning an award. I actually get more of a buzz out of the lights going on in somebody else that I'm kind of teaching and helping. And obviously with this, you know, the COVID lockdowns and everything, it's been tough at times. Other times have actually been okay. Um, but one thing it has done, it's thrown a lot of people online onto things like Zoom. Um, and I've been, like say, teaching people all over the world and there's been some huge advantages to that well how do you see this kind of knowledge industry going forward do you think that um this has kind of been a turning point and now people understand how you can pretty much learn anything online or how people can earn a living literally from from their home with a computer or do you think this was just of the moment and things will pretty much go back to face-to-face -face training in conference rooms and all that kind of thing i think it will be uh it will be another income stream uh, because there's value in it and I think when you look at the entertainment industry that they've now realized that they can do concerts you know with one person playing guitar in New York and another one playing the drums in America you know, we all sort of rolling stones on that thing and they was all in different rooms so I think it's just going to be different but same and when it comes to knowledge you know I remember in the old days if I had to do my homework I didn't have Google. We had to go to the library and find it in a book and look it up. And there was no sort of cut and paste and stuff. So it's always been learning. There's always been that desire to find out more. In many ways now, because it's so easy, I'll oh, just Google it and you can just Google it. It's made it less effective because there's so many more idiots out there posting content on YouTube. I watch a lot of it and some of it I think brilliant. And others, because I've lived through it, I think, oh, I wish I could just jump on there and change that because, you know, that's not good. But it, it's good for that person. That's where they are. But if you're further down the line, you know, you, you're, you're going to look at it and think to yourself, it's not right. So I think it's going to be amazing. I think it's going to be terrible. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be boring. I think it's going to have new people coming along thinking that they're recreating the wheel, but actually we've seen the wheel before. I think there's going to be people making a vast amount of money. I think there's going to be people going broke. I don't think there's any difference, Mark. I really don't. Other than the cream always rises to the top. And through all that, you will find new stars come out and people that have been around forever and a day and you thought to yourself they were the guys somebody is in his special underpants in his bedroom at the moment watching this video who's going to be the next billionaire my son said there's some guy who in the united kingdom he created an app or something and he created it in like june 2020 he's now worth 4.6 billion that probably hopping was it the like it's like a video i don't know thing, yeah it might yeah. be that, yeah. And I thought, well, that shows you that for the right person with the right knowledge base at the right time, bang, you know, you, you can do that. And that, that excites me that somebody out there is in their Power Rangers underpants waiting for that idea to come through to them. But if they're not allowing that idea to come through because they're so busy doing stuff, it's just going to pass them. And final question, you, you've asked your guests about going back and giving advice to younger selves if you at the age of 51 through all this you know ups and downs and pivoting and trying different things if you could go back to yourself and don't say buy apple shares or anything like that um what what would be the kind of the wisdom that you would want to pass on to sum up you know from the knowledge and experience you've gained stay playful and, and i think that my my son 
said to me last night, Dad, you're becoming more weird. <laughs> and my, and my, my wife said, yeah, you were certainly wasn't that weird. I was doing some pirate impression or something, you know. Um, and I said, no, it's not. It's just that I'm becoming more playful. And I think that I got too serious at a time where everything was about the next bill and everything was about the next 100,000 downloads and the next this and next that. And I think I missed the opportunity of enjoying myself and having fun. So, and I would say that to everybody, you know, you are here once, unless somebody tells me otherwise, you're only on this planet once, you know, enjoy yourself, have fun. And if you're spending too many days not having fun, think to yourself, somebody is somebody's teaching a dog to surf somebody is you know making a, a youtube video that somebody you know it's there's always ways to be more playful so that's what i would say to my younger self stay stupid stay fun and as steve jobs said stay foolish yeah no that's i i love that stay fun uh because we can all take ourselves a bit too seriously sometimes especially when times are difficult you know that's often the way to get through it now if yeah i saw your last video i saw your last video and you were so uh, serious it was yeah, untrue yeah yeah i got constructive feedback which is correct uh, i said to david that um sometimes when i'm on camera and you know even though i teach this stuff um coming from a background in news uh where often you're taught you know you've got to be serious these are serious events it's almost become one of those habits that you have to kind of shake and naturally in my normal life i'm relatively smiley i hope but, you know, I still have that thing when I'm on camera where if I'm not concentrating, I go back into journalist mode, which is like, and now everything's terrible. And just to remind you, it's probably yeah. going to be more terrible tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, I luck I'm glad I've got you, David, to uh, remind me to just lighten up a bit. So I appreciate that. Now, if somebody wants S smile, you're on. If Zoom. somebody wants to go deeper, um, learn more about you and, and some of the other projects you're on to do with, you know, nutrition and everything, where can they find out more about you? As I always say, just go to Google and type in join up dots, three simple words. And um, Google's great because you can find loads of things on there. And um, I appear. So um, easy as that. Drop us a line and I'll have a chat with you. And um, yeah, just just have fun. Enjoy yourself. Well, it's been fun chatting to you, I have to say. Um, and I, I, I've been like keeping an eye on the time because I'm conscious, you know, I respect people's time and, you know, um, they want to keep you on here for hours. But I suspect at some point in the future I'm going to have you back on because I've still got loads of things I'd like to ask but really appreciate your time really good insights the things I love about you is that you think things through like you think things through and then you don't try and put the spin that people want to hear you actually kind of say okay this is what my experience is this is what I think these are the ups and the downs and so then you go into it with your eyes open you know if you want to create one of these businesses create a podcast you know, coming at it from the right reasons and doing it for the right reasons. So appreciate your time. I'll let you get back to your, you know, your kids, your garden, your 55 different businesses and um, enjoying yourself. But um, nice chatting to you. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll speak again soon. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a good review. Don't forget to join the Knowledge Industry Group on Facebook. And if you want to connect, head to markeganvideo.com.